If you're a parent, teacher, or school leader, and you're sick and tired of the frustration, anger, and unfair treatment of children at high risk in our public schools, then perhaps it's time for all of us to do something about it. In this podcast, Dr. Amitra Berry brings you tips, tools, strategies, and tactics to build successful solutions while touching, moving, and inspiring all of us to transform our schools so that every child thrives. Here's your host, Dr. Berry. It was Peggy McIntosh who wrote the earliest definitive work on white privilege way back in 1988. Here's something she wrote that should stick with all of us. White privilege is like an invisible, weightless knapsack of special provisions, maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. Hey there, Equity Warriors. Glad we're here again today. Let's talk about privilege, a special privilege, white privilege. What is it? Well, you know, I like my dictionary definitions to get us started, and then I expand after that. But Oxford Dictionary defines privilege as inherent advantages possessed by a white person on the basis of their race in a society characterized by racial inequality and injustice. White privilege, sorry, not just plain privilege, white privilege, but let's break that down. Inherent advantages. These are advantages that are vested by right. I have a right to this advantage. Inherent advantages are permanent, essential, or characteristic. An advantage that is theirs as a right. And you'll hear those words. It's my right. It's granted on the basis of their race. Nothing more on the basis of race. And it exists in a society that is characterized, that has as a distinctive feature Racial inequality and racial injustice. You see, if you don't have racial inequality and racial injustice, you can't have white privilege. It's hard to argue that America as a country is not characterized by racial inequality and racial injustice. The data speaks for itself. Just in our schools, we have achievement gaps. Black-white achievement gap, brown-white achievement gap, SES achievement gap, but racial inequality. So black-white achievement gap, been there forever, doesn't seem to get any smaller. Um, If you take a look at the suspension and expulsion data, hmm, some distinct gaps there as well. Graduation rates by race. Uh Uh-huh. We have policies in our society, such as stop and frisk. We have targeted policing. The arrests and prosecution and incarceration rates of people of color are definitely higher than those of white people. And the only voters I've seen suppressed are people of color, particularly black people. We have health care Inequality, health care inequities. Look at the black fetal mortality rate. We have redlining. We have discrimination in banking. Do I need to keep going? But it's more than that. See, to, to understand white privilege as unique to white people, it's important to understand that people of color who are similarly situated educationally, financially, socially, don't have the same advantages. Think about it. And we have to differentiate white privilege from white racism. Listen to me carefully here. We have to differentiate white privilege from white racism because while all white people do benefit from white privilege, not all white 
people are racist. An invisible, weightless knapsack. It's easy for white people to deny the existence of white privilege because it is so woven into the fabric of their everyday existence, their everyday lived experience, especially if they spend the majority of their time in white dominant spaces. They just don't see it. But people of color, and I want to focus on our children of color, our children of color in our public schools, trust me, they see it. They live it. So I want to tell you the story today, a story of a child of color, a child of cultural and linguistic diversity, a typical everyday experience. This child wakes up in the morning, helps get their siblings ready for school because their parent, a single parent, in spite of an advanced degree, can't find professional work because the degree comes from a non-Western, read that as not American, not European university. This child walks to school through neighborhoods most of their teachers don't feel safe driving through. That neighborhood is the legacy of redlining that kept people of color locked into less desirable neighborhoods. Less desirable not because of who lived there, but because of the proximity to industry and manufacturing that keeps their air and their water less safe. This contributes to higher incidences of asthma and cancer and fetal mortality. It's the impact of gentrification that continues to push people of color and of low financial wealth further away from resources like healthy whole foods and medical care. When this child, after walking through this neighborhood, arrives at school, their teachers don't look like them, never have, and never has this child had a teacher of color that reflected who that child is. And whether it's a primary language or sociocultural language like Chicano English or African American English, their teachers don't speak the same language, and they denigrate the child's language even when the child can articulate at a very high level of comprehension of a concept that others are having difficulty grasping. When the child moves too slowly, they're accused of being lazy. When they move too quickly, they're looked at with suspicion as though they're running away from some mischief that they've caused or created. This child's teachers aren't encouraging them to take AP courses and apply to top-tier colleges in spite of their evidenced high ability. Sure, they may not turn in their homework on time every time. Sometimes the job that this child has to hold down after school to help support their family does get in the way of completing a worksheet. There are also the times that they're without power because they can't pay the electric bill and they don't have Wi-Fi to get access to the internet to complete the assignments. And they notice. They notice when white kids culturally appropriate their language, their Chicano English, their African American English, those same teachers that tell them that that's inappropriate, smile and shake their heads with an, oh, you're so silly, Mocking disapproval, no correction, no sharp criticism. They notice when the white kids move at the same slow pace, there's concern expressed as to whether or not they're okay. And when they run through the halls, they're simply admonished to slow down. They notice when their white peers can call home and have a parent bring in their homework that they carelessly forgot. They notice when the police are called on students of color, but not on the white students who commit the same offenses. They notice when their homes have few books and their lack of wide reading is seen as laziness, not economic disparity. 
they notice when the social studies courses that they're required to take never cover the history or culture of their ancestors. And the few times that it does, it's done so from a deficit perspective. They notice when their religious and cultural holidays are ignored, while events like the Celtic pagan holiday of Halloween is widely celebrated. They notice when year after year, grade after grade, teacher after teacher, counselor, principals, never, ever look like them. They don't share their primary language. They don't share their sociocultural language. They don't share or respect their culture. So what do we do? I'm going to keep asking you, share this message. Share, 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 like, comment, leave a review on iTunes, share it. Because we all have to understand what white privilege is. We all have to understand that is distinctly different from white racism. And I cannot emphasize that enough. People get it convoluted. They get it twisted. And it's up to us to let as many people know as possible. Spread this word. Name it. Name white privilege. Identify where it exists in our schools, in our classrooms, in our organizational cultures, in our content, in our curriculum. Confront it. Fix it. Seek out professional development. Work to eliminate it from the spaces, from the materials, from the cultures in our schools where it festers and harms our children. Keep in mind, people, the existence of white privilege is not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of perspective. The existence of white privilege is a clear and undeniable fact. It is demonstrated by research and lived experience. To deny the existence of white privilege is to deny the experiences of millions of people who endure ongoing oppression just because of the color of their skin. And this affects all of us. Those who benefit from privilege are able to waltz through life to advance without any race-related obstacles. And a lot of people get advanced that shouldn't, that are not ready, that do not have the skills, do not have the education, while others, simply because of the color of their skin, the way their name looks on a resume, are denied opportunities not because they are not skilled or educated or worthy or ready, but because they don't have the white privilege hookup. There's no room for debate on this. White privilege is a fact, one that cannot be denied. So I challenge you to begin this work. It doesn't matter what your role is. I know we have listeners that are parents, teachers, administrators, board members, students, community members. If you're a content developer for a publisher, an educational consultant, to remain silent in the face of what you see and know to be wrong is to be complicit in that wrong. You're doing it too. Even when you may benefit from white privilege, you can do the work to eliminate it. People will listen. White people will listen to white people. Explain white privilege and tell them why it is wrong a whole lot sooner than they will listen to me. And that is why, again, I need you to share this message. See, that's what allies do. True allies put their own selves on the line for their cause. So I challenge you to do that. 
And I also challenge you to keep joining me every week. Send me your questions, topics, and requests to AskDrBerry.com, and I will answer those questions and bring you experts to help address those topics. Don't worry about the things you cannot change. Change the things you can no longer accept. I'll see you next time. That's it for today's episode of the 3E Podcast. Head over to iTunes and subscribe to the show. One lucky listener every single week that posts a review on iTunes will win a chance in a grand prize drawing to win a $25,000 value private VIP day with Dr. Barry herself. Be sure to head over to 3epodcast.com and pick up a free copy of Dr. Barry's gift. Then join us on the next episode.